before us, the Huron Vandats, the Mississauga of Credit, and the Seneca. And in some ways, uh, my uh, talk is going to relate to what uh, the land acknowledgement process. So basically, it really deals with the issue of land and territories of indigenous people and communities. Uh, I had I was kind of thinking whether I should talk about uh, nature-based solutions and climate justice in the urban context, but I decided that I should really look at my strength, which is my work on nature-based solutions, climate justice in the context of Global South, in the rural areas, in the forested landscapes and the marginal landscapes. Uh, my work has been, for the last two and a half decades, I've been working on issues of land rights and uh, territorial rights of indigenous people, local communities. Mostly started, work, started my work from India and I have worked there with grassroots organizations and and movements of uh, indigenous people and local communities. I have worked at uh, uh, national level in Southeast Asian countries and South Asian countries and engaged with these issues of land rights, territorial rights, climate change, conservation at the global level, global scale, trying to understand what's going on. I'm a practitioner even though I might have a little bit of academic background, but I'm a practitioner, I've been, and most of what I have learned is both in terms of the practice, but also in terms of my uh, theoretical orientation is really from the ground, from the people I work with. So theoretically, one means uh, I, I, would, I would see my work as uh, really, trying to understand world in the world in non-dualist, non-Eurocentric manner, and uh, trying to you know, mobilize concepts like assemblers to kind of really see what indigenous people and others have been already talking about and, and the way they have looked at the world. It's in this context that uh, I wanted to address this issue of nature-based solution and climate justice. It's not about, uh, not really about urban climate uh, nature-based solutions, which is something that you're all familiar with, that we have different kinds of uh, solutions for urban areas, which really use ecosystem engineering and related activities to kind of take, uh, to address the climate challenge, the various risks and, and vulnerabilities that uh, climate change and uh, is creating. I'm really looking at uh, my work with uh, rural communities uh, in the south, mostly from the south, indigenous people, local communities, traditional communities. And uh, and in that context, I'm looking at this whole idea called nature-based nature -based solutions. And yes. the structure of my talk is uh, kind of the four tropes that uh, I'll talk about, and I'll try to be brief about it. There's a lot of stuff, but uh, uh, nature-based solution for climate mitigation, what are these? Uh, looking at indigenous people and local communities, traditional communities, lands and territories at the global level and at ground level. Indigenous people and local communities as stewards of land and ecosystems, and bringing this together in a climate justice framework. So, um, I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard about nature-based solutions uh, in context of climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. Uh, the urban uh, nature-based solutions generally tend to be about uh, adaptation, trying to adapt to what is happening with the, the whole climate change, the, the, the natural events, the vulnerability of people living in certain areas, the heat problem, uh, whereas, uh, the mitigation is largely looking at, when you talk about nature-based solution, largely looks at land-based activities which employ nature or as called ecosystem processes to, to mitigate carbon and greenhouse gas emission, both by, both by uh, 
by reducing the emissions from land use, forests, deforestation, etc., as uh, uh, and as well as uh, creating what you would call it negative emissions, that is capturing carbon. So uh, there are people have talked about carbon capture uh, in context of climate change, and uh, so there are two types: engineered solutions and and uh, the natural solutions. So if you protect, if you regenerate a forest, if you plant trees, and you would have heard about the trillion trees campaign and so on and so forth, that that likely captures and retains carbon from the atmosphere. So now this concept is promoted by a certain set of organizations and power actors in the world. It includes uh, international NGOs, it includes uh, um, UN organizations, it includes the uh, corporate sector, which is looking at nature-based solution to get to its uh, net zero commitments. Uh, and it includes uh, governments and others who kind of see this as both a revenue generation um, or something which can be used to generate income, as well as something which can be used to uh, avert or redu reduce your own commitment to reducing emissions. So that's kind of different actors, and it's become a very powerful trope now. And this is from a graph is from the McKinsey's. And just one thing that it basically says that nature-based solutions uh, would, if you want to remain below 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade by 2050, uh, nature-based solutions should would provide around 25% of the mitigation potential. So one side you have adaptation, other side you have the mitigation potential. So you're talking about actually, apart from reducing you know, emissions, removing fossil fuel from your energy production system, nature-based solutions is 25%. And this is something which uh, more or less, this is from McKinsey's report, but uh, more or less the various uh, UN organizations, the other kind of people who are pushing the nature-based solution, they agree with it. So I think that's one core, Messes that we have, and there are different ways of uh, you know different activities that you can do: forestry, forest reforestation, protecting forest, protecting wet wetlands, protecting peatlands, etc. Now, the key question for us uh, that uh, is important is that it's really land intensive, and ecological restoration, for example, which is a restoration of ecosystems, would the estimates around one billion hectares. And uh, then there is the 30 by 30 conversion target, which is basically protecting 30% of the Earth's surface, linked to climate. It's also been touted as a climate uh, mitigation measure. And that covers 30% terrestrial and marine, marine area. And, and uh, one of the things that we see is that most of, many other countries already have committed to, to conserve 30% of their area, including countries like India and Nepal. And, mm -hmm. So these are land intensive and going to require quite a bit of land. Most of the nature-based solutions are located in global south. And uh, in the sense of looking at Brazil, um, Indonesia, um, Africa, so basically in and, and other countries in the south. Obviously the money for this is going to be raised in the north. So this, there is a whole kind of apparatus, a whole system which has emerged over the last 20 years, which has been pull, pushing these solutions. And both all global institutions, research institutions, UN organizations, um, corporate sector, many, many of them involved in different ways. Uh, there are some key players like WRI uh, and uh, others who provide um, who kind of underpin this uh, apparatus is assembling uh, the emerging assemblers, which is from the top, which is from above, and which is kind of going to influence the way we are doing, going to deal with land and water and and people living in those lands in the in in the next twenty to thirty years. It's really powerful, and one of the things that really when they're talking about nature-based solution, they're talking about what are the finances that are required. That's the first question. People on the top ask, where do we get the money from? What's the budget? And uh, 
So they're looking at uh, currently UN, this is a UNEP report which just came out last year, and it says that uh, currently governments are investing 154 billion governments and private sector in nature-based solutions. Most of it in by governments in Europe and and uh, in North America, and this basically involves all the money that's going to protected areas, all the money that's going for managing land in a more sustainable manner. And it won't, they want to, they basically say that if you want to reach the target of 1.5 degrees centigrade, we need to increase more than double it by 2030 and nearly four times by 2050. And that's the, the money that is sought to be mobilized. So it's basically over the, till 2050, around $11 trillion of money is sought to mobilize for nature solutions. And the important part of this is that obviously given the strapped, uh, cash strap situation of the governments, the money is sought to be raised from the private sector. From the So the language that uh, is used in the UNEP report, unlock capital from institutional investors, high net worth individuals and private equity. Harness the potential of carbon nature markets and carbon markets using carbon markets and offsets, carbon credits and offsets. And this is uh, essentially looking at that making nature-based solutions into uh, return on investment activities, profitable activities. And this is uh, uh, <clears throat> because uh, also, the even where the governments are uh, kind of involved using public fund, that can also lead to problems. But focusing on both uh, kind of uh, really looking at how this kind of apparatus that has emerged at the global level and kind of reaching out into different countries is affecting uh, people on the ground. And so that's kind of the work that I want to talk about climate justice in that context. So. What we have been doing is that uh, some of us uh, in, and kind of uh, looking at what is the number of people who are living in these areas that are being identified by nature, for nature-based solution. Because what uh, these organizations are doing is that they are identifying the priority areas using global satellite imagery, using using you know their indicators, and uh, more point one point more than one point four billion people live in the area identified as having the twenty percent restoration priority and most of them most of them obviously in the in the south uh, and these are rural means rural forested areas desert landscapes grassland landscapes and this uh, study that uh, i was involved in and led showed we basically looked at how many people live to meet the 30 by 30 kind of biodiversity target how many people live in those high high priority biodiversity conservation area. So we found that around 1.6 to 1.8 billion people live there. So most of the areas targeted for nature-based solution are tro tropical country are inhabited by indigenous people and traditional local communities, pastoralists, hunter-gatherers, and so forth. So that brings me to the next uh, part, as the next connecting part here, that we talk about nature-based solution and uh, and the fact that they are basically seen as a return on investment activity, most of it, and uh, the mechanism that is being used at this point of time is largely offsets. So it's biodiversity offsets, it's uh, carbon carbon credits and offsets, um, it's payment for e e ecosystem services, and all of you must be familiar with when you're flying, you have an option. Can we offset? You can offset your flight through that. So likely that is from one of these uh, projects somewhere in the south, in Colombia or maybe somewhere else. Um, most of the, uh, the, the, I'll be talking about it, but most of the big companies who are trying to offset their carbon emissions, um, including fossil fuel producers, are, are you know, using the credits, carbon credit from global south. And, and which, which has its, the, is not doing a very, Critical analysis, even from a normal, you know, developmental practice, uh, has a lot of problem. Uh, the way I have, when I talk about these things, I talk to audiences uh, uh, in policy making circles. So I'm not doing a critical analysis 
of uh, of what what is going on i'm just doing a normal you know policy level analysis which can get some message across so talking about indigenous people and and local communities lands and territories so this is a study that uh, i was uh, involved in in a couple of years three years back you know historically most of the land in the world was kind of managed governed lived in by indigenous people local communities traditional communities and as nation states emerged and the call with, with colonialism the whole process of uh, takeover of these lands it has been the most contentious issue and this has happened in all parts of the world in some places it has been colonial settler uh, states it has been uh, genocidal processes or just uh, taking away the land using various means and you know legal fictions as such in countries in 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 colonial countries like in countries like india or or say for example um, indonesia it has been again kind of because this was not settler colonial there a lot of very strong origin population there were different methods through clearing areas of forest uh, terrorizing landscapes basically saying that if you don't cultivate this land if you are cultivating this land this is yours if you're not cultivating this land or the, all of it is government's so there was a process of territorialization which took place all over the world and during the during the emergence of uh, modernity now, i don't want to go into the details of that and but in spite of that in some areas some places these systems have continued in some places because of the struggle of indigenous people and local communities and traditional people they have been able to wrestle back some of the rights and so we we did a study of around 42 countries in in uh, in the world which was uh, covers around 50% of the land area and what we found is that almost 50% of that is lived in claimed by or owned by or managed by indigenous people local communities traditional communities and these are generally marginalized landscapes landscapes which are not in the core these are the peripheral landscapes uh, the vast areas of deserts the vast mountain areas and out of that we found that almost 50% of that that land which is claimed or lived in by indigenous people only 50% they have some kind of legal protection of their rights the rest of it they don't have any legal protection that means there is no recognition it's, there's no recognition of their rights on these lands and most of the lands with legal protection is in north america and canada um, australia and parts of latin america if you look at asia and africa there's very little yeah that's rights and resources initiative rights and resources initiative yeah. and so in uh, africa and asia the land remains largely unrecognized and this has led to problems which i just use some of the examples from my own work in the field to illustrate that this basically shows the that uh, in the green portion is the amount of land that is recognized and the green plus red portion is the amount of land that they claim and uh, the indigenous people claim and you can see that it's uh, except in latin america the greens are smaller and in africa also there is some recognition of land because of constitutional processes but still the there is much more customary land in in africa which is not recognized this is both africa and asia the situation is not very good latin america some countries it's is doing this there is uh, recognition of rights however recognition of rights also does not mean that these lands are protected or recognition so when the government wants that land it takes it away and that's the example of when bolsonaro was, was there in brazil the land was land invasions took place they could and uh, so it's not a secure right and uh, so the second point is that you know 50% of the land more or less kind of that's our assessment of uh, is their indigenous people local communities traditional communities live on them claim them use them manage them and out of that half of that is there is no legal protection and it is in this context that we are having the nature based solutions being implementation of nature based solutions the third one is that 
there's no ample evidence that indigenous people, local communities, traditional communities, it's in those lands, it is in their territories and lands that they live in, which has the rest of the, most of the world's biodiversity and most of the world's remaining carbon. So 80% of the biodiversity in the world is located in the land of indigenous people, local communities, traditional communities, which is, this is just, these two maps kind of illustrate some of those, 40% uh, of intact forests are in their land, claimed lands and territories. And even from the field, it's very, especially from Amazonia, but all over the world, they're pretty clear evidence now using uh, satellite imagery that areas which are uh, under, which has been recognized by indigenous people, for indigenous people and, and traditional communities is doing much better and being protected much better than areas which have been left open access or under the control of government. In, in, so this, these, these, what this shows is that that indigenous people have been and local communities, traditional communities have been good stewards of land, even in spite of all the pressures and all the all the stress that have been facing. And this is something which, of course, you know about in Canada that this is this is applicable in Canada. It's been talked about regularly, and the struggles of indigenous people to the First Nations to protect their territories and land from you know, different kind of extractive activities. It's also true for most of the world. Almost all countries of the world where indigenous people, local communities have some kind of rights or customary systems, the performance there tend to be better. And from climate change perspective, a study which uh, came out in 2018 with the Woodhull uh, Institute, and it looked at a global baseline of uh, of carbon in indigenous people's local communities land. And it basically found that 300 billion tons of carbon is located in both in terms of biomass and soil carbon in their lands and territories. And this is with what is already recognized. And this is around 33 times the total global emissions of. So that, so the second thing is that, so they have been good stewards of their lands. Now, the nature-based solutions, generally because these lands are rich in biodiversity and these lands are rich in carbon, so those nature-based solutions that our uh, people have been talking about at the global level is going to be largely implemented on these lands, which indigenous people live in, claim, and part of it where the rights are not recognized. Now, I'll just take some examples from the ground and, and from India, from my work, and show how uh, nature-based solutions really work on the ground. And uh, so India has a long history of, uh, you know, uh, using nature-based solutions for, for environmental purposes, for, for conservation, for uh, protecting watersheds. And, and uh, so they have, they have this long history. And uh, so their exp experience from there can kind of help us understand what might happen elsewhere, what is happening elsewhere, uh, and give you an um, idea of what's on the ground. Now, the point is that every, the uh, in, in around 30% of land forest, and these forest lands have been gen generally been created on the customary lands of indigenous local communities. And uh, India's, uh, in, in, the, in the 18th century, India's, most of India's land was actually shifting cultivation landscapes. Uh, it was agroforestry landscapes. And these were uh, converted into forest by the British and the uh, post-colonial government. And one of the things that they did was that they imposed very strict rules to stop shifting cultivation, stop the use of this forest by local communities and, and convert them into forests. So in fact, India's forests are regenerated or secondary forests which have come from shifting cultivation landscapes. So th the interesting thing is that everything that a, a person who lives close to the forest and who depends on the forest wants to do is criminalized. And this, the context of this is that almost now around almost 200 or 250 million people live in and around forests in India. These are mostly, many of them are, are, are what we call Adivasis or indigenous people. Uh, others are uh, Dalits, which is what we call the lower caste people. And then there are traditional communities and others who live in and around the forest and they, whose livelihood partially or sometimes fully depends on the forest. 
and it could be include subsistence as well as income generation. And there's a lot of literature on this which shows, especially in in, in context. So everything that they do for their livelihood or subsistence in the forest, if, if you look at this law, which is at present, which is being used, is, is in contravention. It's a criminal act for which they can be. So what this does is that it criminalizes 200 million people. It literally laws criminalize their lives and livelihoods. And this is the context in which we are trying to put in, think about nature-based solutions. So these are some examples of, uh, uh, of the process of criminalization. And, uh, and what it does is that it really disempowers the people who live in and around the forest because the, the people who are the apparatus that is in charge of implementing these laws use it on a discretionary basis. And it only applies it when, when it wants to or when it wants to make some rent out of it. So if you pay rent to the officers, you're not arrested, you're not criminalized. Moment you stop paying the rent, you're criminalized. So, so it basically disempowers, makes everybody into thieves and criminals. And that's, that has been a major problem. And that essentially is really linked to this process has been linked to poverty and marginalization of the Adivasis and, and local communities for in the forest areas for a very long time. So these are a couple of headlines which are very recent. So it's not like as if this is from the past. It's like 21, 22, 23. And you can see the uh, headlines here. And uh, one of the things that really kind of, uh, because even, even though shifting cultivation has been stamped out in certain areas, it still continues. And this is customary lands of Adivasis and they use the land for shifting cultivation and that particular land use is criminalized. And so we have always have conflicts because they have to do to survive. And, and this is an example of, uh, of a conflict between tribals, Adivasis and, and the government. The reason for this conflict is that the government wants to use that land for plantations, uh, plantation for restoring the land. And uh, this is part of a big program by Telangana government called Haitha Haram, which is basically greening the countryside. So this is a nature-based solution with very, very, env basically environmental and restoration purposes. It's not commercial plantation, it's environmental plantation, which leads to this kind of conflict. Uh, one of the major programs in India is about uh, compensation for when there is a compensatory afforestation scheme where government, uh, when some company or some company or um, uh, infrastructure project requires forest land, they're supposed to pay an amount of money and ensure that equal amount of land or double the amount of land is afforested. So this is a payment for ecosystem services kind of program. This is, and from here, it looks really progressive. You know? You're destroying forest, you're creating forests. But this has become a major problem for people who live in these areas because these tree plantations often are being done on their, their lands. And underneath all this is the fact that they still live on their customary lands. They still use those lands, but those lands are not legal, legally recognized as their lands. So th these, these are unrecognized lands. They don't have rights on them even though they, they and their ancestors have lived on the lands and used the lands for similar to what you have in, in, in this country, in Canada. So even the COVID recovery plan for in the Adivasi areas, the government after COVID, they decided that they'll do plantations, afforestation in Adivasi areas to, to, to kind of provide you know, support to, in, because livelihood systems had collapsed. And even that has led to conflicts where the customary land of indigenous people has been used for uh, plantations. Now, there is a whole political dynamics behind this at the ground level processes where basically the people who are doing the plantation, which is government officials or, or contractors, 
they have a vested interest in continuing to do plantations because they can make money out of it. It's, like, it's the same thing as doing engineering because you can you know, get big contracts. And that's, so the whole interest becomes that how much plantation you can do. And it's kind of the money then flows from, from top to bottom. So it's not just the people who worked in South would know that there are systems of channelizing rent right to the top of the, of the system. So in that sense, there's a whole perverse incentive in name of environment and conservation to, to, to displace and uh, indigenous people and local communities. And then of course, the issue of protected areas is very important in India. Around 5% of the area of India is, is, is protected as national parks or sanctuaries. And these are all, most of them are flashpoints of contention because one, they have been created on customary lands of indigenous people, local communities, and then they are removed there. So there are cases where displacement has taken place. And even if displacement is not taken, has not happened, their livelihoods have been displaced because the rules, the protected areas laws are so strong that you can't even go and cut a, break a leaf. You can be arrested for breaking a leaf from a tree inside the protected area. You can't go inside the protected area, but people go inside, they live inside them, and then they basically get criminalized as per the discretion of the officials. And so this shows a set of you know, flashpoints all across the country. It's in this context that, uh, so this, this has been going on for a long time. And uh, so the, the issue of uh, environment and conservation has been used to dispossess people from their lands. And the real reason is that the rights on their land, that custom land that they used to live in, were not recognized. That's where the connection with the earlier uh, section on indigenous people's territories and land and uh, non-recognition of those. So they basically are trespassers in their own land and they are criminalized by that process. And therefore there has been struggles. There have been struggles for the last, over the last century and a half or over these lands forest lands and other lands that government has taken over. And, uh, and these struggles led to this law to recognize and protect the rights of indigenous people. So this was a very interesting um, case of using a politically opportune moment by a grassroots level movement, which is really powerless against the state to push for uh, a law which was emancipatory and which recognized rights on the lands and forests. And, <clears throat> and which recognize that historical injustices have been done. And the interesting part of it is that wherever this law has been implemented, especially when community rights have been given, there's an explosion of, uh, there's a resurgence of stewardship of land and forests because state lands have now come back to communities. So there are so many examples of uh, communities protecting the forests, as well as communities regenerating, restoring, plant, doing plantation, raising, obtaining funds from government and, and uh, improving the forest. And these are a couple of examples that um, protecting forests from forest fires and so on and so forth. And so the, the relationship, the law at least you know, provides space for a re-establishment of relationship between uh, communities and, and the forest. So that's that broken relationship that was there. However, the implementation of this law is generally opposed by powerful actors in the uh, Indian state, especially the, the forest bureaucracy, which controls the forest land, and as well as political leadership, because uh, because main reason is that communities, when they are given right, uh, they start, uh, they don't want to let the land go when uh, it is required for an infrastructure project or a, or a major development project. And that's kind of uh, the, Modi government has this really, really um, wants to develop things. And they find that forest lands and government lands are the most important asset for them to divert, give to private sector for various activities, including renewable energy. And that becomes problematic if you have communities have rights on this. So it's a bugbear for the government. So they have, they have been uh, kind of not, uh, the, the implementation has been quite poor. So around 10% of the potential of the Forest Right Act, which is, we, we think around 40 million hectares should uh, go to communities under the Forest Right Act. 
another 15 to 20 million hectares should go in recognition of other uh, government land or what common, common lands which are not termed as forest. Out of that, barely 10% has uh, really been transferred or shifted gone to communities. Meanwhile, there's a new spate of activities which is driven by the global nature-based solution. Now, this is basically really drawing from the whole discourse on carbon credits, on biodiversity offsets. And, and so the whole idea of having green credits and carbon credits. And uh, the, the field act the activists who are working on forest rights basically say that it's, it's a backdoor entry for private sector into the forest land. Because unlike in Canada, where private sector has access to forest land, in, in India, because of resistance of uh, the movements, it has been very difficult for government to hand over forest lands in large chunks to private sector for plantations. So this is a backdoor entry to, because to, and the, the, basically this will be credible credits for activities which have environmental benefits and they can be traded in the market and forest plantations will be part of this. So any, anybody can, can obtain a piece of land, plant, plant, do a plantation and then trade it in the market and they'll get a credit for it. The details of this program is not yet clear. It's just they have started in 2020 and now 2023 they have trying to push the rules, create the rules for this. But when it comes, it will really affect the, because now it will be a major upscaling of uh, all these nature-based solutions in, in, in uh, India. There are many more examples. This is from India, and this is essentially, you know, what is happening on the ground, and because uh, my experiences. But you have similar examples of conflict exclusions and risk arising out of NBS. And one example is the re re reduction of reduced emission through uh, degradation and uh, reduced emissions through degradation deforestation. This is a scheme or program that has been promoted by the World Bank and others, UN organizations, as a carbon uh, kind of payment of services, uh, payment for services of forest protection. Then there is the voluntary carbon market in forests, which I talked about. And so these are some of the examples where there have been conflicts and, and serious conflicts on, on, on in Africa, in Asia, in, in uh, Latin America. And uh, this is at a low scale I, at this point of time, but this is expected to increase because just in the last three years, the voluntary carbon market in nature-based solutions kind of jumped fourfold as, as the pressure or kind of this whole thing gets, becomes important and net zero commitments and, uh, and uh, for companies becomes really important. So this, this is going to ramp up quite a bit. So what, would happen is that it will join extractive industries, agribusiness, um, other uh, other processes which are disenfranchising and disposing indigenous people, local communities in the world. So carbon mitigation, climate mitigation, is lead to uh, this these kind of negative repercussions. Um, the second aspect of this is when you're looking at uh, nature-based solution conservation, the history of conservation in the world is, especially in the South, has been really grim. And it has been one of the major causes of displacement and exclusion of indigenous people, local communities, and forested landscapes. There's a ton of stuff on that. And, and uh, uh, this now that 30 by 30 is being adopted, the indigenous people's organizations and local communities, the formations basically are opposing this because they see it as risking their, their, their access to land because they, are, they, they believe that exclusionary conservation will be extended to the area. So even though there are safeguards in the, in the biodiversity, global biodiversity framework, but still there's fear that this might lead to uh, exclusion and which is What's like, for example, it's already uh, right now. That's what's happening in India and other countries. And if you if you look at it, then you'll find every few days you'll find the news about some protected area, some conflict happening across the world. So that brings us to sort of 
climate justice and nature based solution and in trying to think about framing of this um, this is a graph that i use for climate justice and this is, it's basically from oxfam uh, it has been challenged a bit but basically it says that richest 10% are responsible for 50% of emissions. So they're just not looking at the countries, but looking at uh, the consumption pattern and the income pattern. And that uh, the middle, the poorest 50% are responsible for 8% of emission. So the climate justice issue here is that, you know, all these people you're talking about who are being affected by this, by, by nature-based solution are basically on the, in the bottom half and in fact, the lower part of the bottom half. So they're not responsible for climate change at all. And in fact, many of them, many of these people are climate positive in the sense that their activities actually sequester carbon because they steward and protect forest. Um, and one can go on about you know, the injustices in this particular graph. And so, but it's useful to just keep it in mind when we are talking about or thinking about nature-based solutions. And then, and it's pretty clear, and all of you know that, that uh, the human vulnerability to climate is much more in the, in the poorer countries, in the tropics, in, in the countries in the south. So that positionality. And then because the, the people who are going to be affected by nature-based solutions generally live in fragile and uh, remote landscapes, and fragile landscapes, which are more likely to be more affected by changes in climate. So if you're living in areas which have already have marginal rainfall and possibility of drought, an increase in drought because of climate change can really destroy your livelihood. And this, this has been happening in places in Africa and other places. So that uh, the vulnerability is there. And of course, the contribution is not there. And then we have the whole situation of, of nature-based solution. Just a minute. Okay. So summing up, So summing up, essentially, this is the basically end my talk. I don't know how much time I've taken, not much. And uh, in Oko's terms, terms which look really nice from perspective, you know, these perspectives, we're talking about nature-based solutions, uh, can carry so much of, of, of uh, injustice, the baggage of injustice with them, possibilities. And, and the need to really be, be critical and understanding about what's being done in name of climate mitigation and, and to be incorporate that into the, those injustices and the action against the injustices into our own climate mobilizations that we are trying to do and we're looking at trying to reduce emissions, the, the upsurge against uh, climate change that is out which I don't see, it's difficult to see any hope. And it's it's and at at a more kind of uh, theoretical level, there's so many problems with whole nature-based solutions idea. And it's whose nature, which nature, am I part of nature? Which solutions are not natural solutions or nature-based solutions, so on and so forth. But uh, given that this is the dominant discourse, one has to kind of uh, and it's really being pushed ahead at a really rapid pace. And uh, it's one has to understand that even though there's inherent injustice in this uh, process. But on the ground, the people who are being affected by it or negatively affected by it are the most marginalized. They don't have a say in the power structures. Whereas the flow of funds and flow of money and resources would create incentives for powerful actors on the ground, the governments, the bureaucrats, the corporate sector, to really move forward and implement this without asking the consent or, or taking into account the interest of people whom they already kind of see as you no know, subhuman, you know, Adivasi or 
is, is, is the, that's the normal like what we have in Canada is, is basically a sort of extraction, potential extraction of rent from landscapes, which were erstwhile they were not so valuable. Suddenly they have become valuable for for all the powerful actors in the world. And and we are literally talking about dumping in trillions of dollars raised from private sector and raised from from the the hedge funds or whatever the pension funds etc so this is something which uh, which uh, the inability of uh, the people who are affected to kind of resist this in a manner and when they resist their repressions happen so there has as you saw this this is very common the repression in the name of conservation and environmental uh, environment in, in, in all of these parts of the world and <laughs> So that's something which uh, one needs to really think about. And uh, that's my work. I'm trying to frame it and uh, bring it into more coherent uh, climate justice framework or, and, and, uh, and try to see that how can we share it with uh, practitioners and, and uh, kind of, so this, this time period with all of you gave me a time to think about all these experiences, put them together and it's still ongoing work. So frankly speaking, when I look at what can we do or what, what are the possible um, paths forward, I'm not very optimistic because even in terms of climate change, I'm not very optimistic, but this is the power asymmetries are so high and the forces pushing for uh, financialization of these lands and nature are so powerful that it does, at this point in time, it really seems very difficult that this can be halt it. Likely what is going to happen is that as these things move forward, there will be a lot of conflict on the ground. And hopefully if our sort of the mechanisms for civility or kind of human rights at the global level still exist. Right? They don't seem to be existing anymore. Then in that case, hopefully there will be international pressure to reduce uh, um, this or kind of create safeguards. And <clears throat> But at least this point, what we are trying to do, and is as a practitioner, that uh, kind of do as much research and evidence gathering, which can support IPs and indigenous peoples and local communities on this issue, and we support the alternative discourses and worldviews. So it's pretty clear that they are the they are very good stewards of lands. You don't need to take away that land from them to you know protect that land. So there are ways of without investing so much of money. Uh, there's ways of working with those communities, recognizing their rights on the lands and, and basically helping them to protect and govern and manage these lands sustainably, sequester carbon, improve biodiversity. They've already been doing it. So that's that solution is, is I think, already being implemented. And now there is a counter discourse which has emerged at the global level also, which legitimizes this process. And hopefully that would help to counter some of this, uh, the top-down, uh, carbon market-based, nature-based solutions. So research and evidence gathering from the field really useful and allyship with struggles on the ground and organizing support. So every day, even in India, when like it's so difficult to get people to pay attention to this process and to get uh, government or government officials or, or politicians to listen to some of these because it's so the environment and tree planting is so deeply ingrained in their minds. So there, I think the academics and researchers have a real role to play because what you what is comes from the West and what comes from the academia is seen as is, is taken more seriously than what activists and people on the ground say. So that allyship with them and being able to kind of reflect, take that to the different levels of power and try to try to create spaces for them. And I think the important thing would be to also build the linkages between the struggles against uh, based solution and climate justice in the South and climate justice movements in the North. I think that's a really important thing, which they are efforts to do it, but still there is a huge gap. And there are reasons for that gap, but uh, I think that's something which uh, people who are involved in the climate justice mobilizations in the North is really, it, we owe, owe it to those people. It's, it's like, you know, uh, literally, they are they are put in the sacrifice zone of of climate change. You're uh, you're affected by climate change, and then your land is being used for 
climate change solutions. And kind of incorporate these demands on climate justice in context of nature-based solution within climate justice movements, as well as other movements for justice. So this, these are some of the ideas that I'm trying to kind of form up. There's a lot of work going on on this uh, with uh, by especially by indigenous uh, people's organizations and some of the uh, more radical groups. Um, uh, um, the connections between North and South is also being built. The various networks have, some of them have started paying attention to the threat that and nature-based solutions pose. And there have been statements of opposition to this whole concept of nature-based solution. It's the first question they ask is that, what nature are you talking about? And this means, are we outside nature? It's, it's part of, so, and that we have always protected nature as nature with a capital N as. So this, these, these are some of the uh, things that I'm trying to do, but it's also part of a larger struggle which is happening.